Good afternoon. So that we can stay on schedule and end in time for the reception tonight, we're going to start. I'm Stephanie Norby, and I'm the director of the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. That's a central office of education at the Smithsonian, and our primary audience is serving schools, pre-K to 12, including teachers, students, parents, both in and out of school. And I'm going to be the facilitator for this session. The theme of the digitization conference this year is engagement. And engagement has two meanings. The first kind of engagement is, I am engaged, congratulations, a kind of commitment to somebody. It can also be going to lunch. So there are different kinds of engagement, but it's about interaction. The second kind is more about personal engagement, and that's a focus. It's when you truly focus on something, where you focus all of your interest in doing something. And we're going to talk about engagement during this session using both of those meanings. Museum visits in the physical museum have always been about engagement. It's always been the argument we make for the purpose of museums. Because when you're in a museum, you decide what you're interested in. You decide how long you're going to look, what you're going to look at. You have conversations with people along the way. And in part of advocating for museums, we've always talked about the value of the real thing, the authentic thing. To look up at Apollo 11, to be six inches away from Lincoln's hat, to experience hundreds of butterflies flying around you in a natural history museum. It's that experience. But we know that not everybody can come to our museums, or if they do come, it's infrequently. And even when they do come, only 3% of our collections are made available. And in our most recent strategic plan for the Smithsonian, we set the goal of reaching a billion people. And even though we have 19 museums and a zoo, that's not going to be possible in our physical spaces. So this gets to the fundamental definition of a museum. What is the museum experience? What is it when it's digital? What is it when it's physical and in person? And that's another topic that we're going to be looking at today. But the other thing we look at in education is what does digital engagement mean? When we talk about visiting a museum in person, or when we talk about going to a national park, or when we talk about conducting a chemistry experiment in a lab, that's a physical in-person experience. But now we have new tools that were not available before through digitization. So how does that complement the experience? How does it interact? What added value does it provide? So this session is really asking a very fundamental question. Schools are making a tremendous investment in digitization buying computers, bandwidth. Museums are making a tremendous investment digitizing their collections. And so this question is asking, what is the value of that enormous effort to education? What difference does it make? And to help us think about these big questions, we have some esteemed panelists that I'd now like to introduce. First, on the right, we have Alison Fritz Penniman, and she is a scientist who uses technology to engage in understanding and preserving diverse ecosystems. She's done this through her work with HYDRAS, both with the digitization program here at the Smithsonian and with National Geographic, and also through iNaturalist, which is a program through the California Academy of Sciences. And she's going to talk about these two different ways of interacting. I'd also like to introduce Sean Wybrand, and he is the 2017 Colorado Teacher of the Year. And he teaches career and technical education at William J. Palmer High School in Colorado Springs. He's going to talk about how he has engaged his high school students in making their own digital collections. And he's currently working on an immersive Smithsonian gallery experience in his, in his school cafeteria. Now, he's joined in his presentation by Stuart Richardson, who was formerly a student of Sean's. Stuart has gone on to, he's currently a college student at the University of Utah, and he's also a video game producer. And Sean, he is, Stuart's going to talk about how he's mixed, he's 
he's going to, he's using mixed reality to create experiences that were previously impossible. After their three presentations, I'm going to show a short video, just a short four minute video, that shows a teacher in a classroom and how they curate our digital collections, and then we'll open it to discussion. Would you like to begin? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I was really excited that we started off the day talking about preservation and time, because I'm used to not only thinking about the long now, but thinking about the time before and after humans and preserving the other forms of life that exist on Earth, uh, despite our best efforts to destroy them, apparently. So, specifically coral reefs, just a little bit of background to get everyone in the same frame of mind. They are the most diverse marine ecosystems on the planet and they've existed long before humans and hopefully long after humans. And they're also very important to people right now. So Smithsonian wants to reach a billion people. Guess what? Coral reefs already reach a billion people. <laughs> so let's just put all the funding towards corals instead. Um, <laughs> so they do a lot. They provide food and livelihood uh, through fishing, tourism, etc. So unfortunately, people aren't doing the best for corals, and these, this photo was taken just a few months after that previous photo by scientists at California Academy of Sciences, and they saw widespread bleaching in this area. And that's a function of climate change. So why I am interested in education is because I think education plays a huge role in uh, basically inspiring empathy for these ecosystems and also understanding for how the ecosystem is so useful to humans. So digitization is helping us a lot with that process. Uh, the sort of basic mass digitization that you've seen already uh, are the actual, so we've collected a lot of specimens from these ecosystems and they, you can view these through their photographs online. Here, these are some Smithsonian collections. And then, through the work with the hydras, we've actually moved on to doing, well, 3D models of both specimens and even live corals. So um, here's the, the, that exact specimen that's been turned into a 3D model. This is just the, kind of the draft as it is now, and we're going to work more on these later. So this is a preview on some models that will be available. So this is a specimen that's here at the Smithsonian, and then here is a live uh, coral of the same species that has been captured via under, underwater photogrammetry. So doing all of this underwater is a special challenge, which I personally have not <laughs> been tackling, but uh, I'm excited to work with the, the outcomes of that, which are these models that you can anyone can view online and, and manipulate and look at. And in addition to the corals themselves, we also have a lot of other species. So a few examples here this box fish, um, this is very low-tech video of me just manipulating the 3D models myself on my laptop, and this really beautiful model of a hawksbill sea turtle, which is exciting because it has, still has color unlike a lot of animals. So why digitize? So the specimens that we have in there, you know, both alive and then after they've been preserved are really valuable for a lot of reasons. We all know this. Um, and there's a lot of data that you can digitize from live specimens that you've collected. And I think, you know, my specialty is with DNA. So that's a huge realm of like, we can capture their entire genome and save that for a future record. Um, but of course, it would be better if we didn't remove animals from the ecosystem, right? So it's really amazing that we can now capture digital collections and leave the living animal there as well. So uh, then we end up with that digital model, but if we want a hands-on experience, we can then print out that specimen into now a physical model. And so we've done this with the hydras and created these coral models that are gonna be distributed as part of an educational curriculum on coral reefs. And they even change color when you put them in warmer water. So these model bleaching 
and I'm going to show a demonstration that. Do you want to put it inside? That sounds like an interesting experiment. What? Nothing. Nothing. Because that one's warm. Take it out and put it in the cold. Whoa! That's the moment when they moved it from cold water to warm water. Oh, it turned bleach in the warm. Warm water bleach tomorrow. The warm water bleach. I get it now. I get the experiment. No, there's something in the water. No, bro. The cold of the water, the better it is for the coral. So, if you listen to what they're saying, you can hear the. What are you guys finding out? Uh, the students, uh, you know, the the facilitators of that, so that was Erica Woolsey, who's CEO of the Hydras, and Dave Greenberg, who's on our education team. They didn't say anything, right? You could just hear the students experiencing what they were doing and, and observing and, and coming up with their hypotheses based on what they had already learned about corals. So that's kind of what we're getting at is kind of <laughs> we digitize and then we undigitize to have a physical thing that students can play with. Uh, and that doesn't mean we're going to leave the 3D models alone. We, there's so much we can do with those. So I just wanted to kind of get out of presentation mode for a minute and show you. So we've got some, this is the example of one of the tours that is existing now where you, we have a model that anyone can look at online. This is the Smithsonian. I didn't have anything to do with this particular one. <laughs> so. And then you can click through information about that. Um, and so we're gonna we're working on creating more of these tours that incorporate several models and kind of create a whole ecosystem that you can explore, and really guide that experience with the digital data. And then the other thing I wanted to show you, which is kind of unrelated, but we've also <laughs> digitized the experience of collecting data as well, right? So anyone can go out and take a photo of any plant or animal they see and upload it as a data point, a digital data point to iNaturalist. And so today during lunch, I went and I happened to see these huge bumblebees. So I uploaded this observation of them. And I, I don't know a lot about bumblebees, but someone is gonna now confirm or you know give me an ID for what this is and then I can check back and I'll learn from that experience. And then it exists as a, a cool data point. So on my profile, it's mostly marine species right now. Um, I've actually moved on from my postdoc and now I'm teaching biology at Mount Hood Community College, but I'm still gonna be watching this, uh, my projects on here and hoping that people upload observations and data that I can use and that is a learning experience for them. So that's what I do and we can talk more about it in the discussion. <laughs> <clears throat> Does it work? I don't know. Yes, oh, it does. Yeah. So hi, everybody. Uh, whoa. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Sean. I teach kids about computer science video game design. Uh, and what we've been doing for the last couple of years is getting into immersive technologies and really trying to figure out what does it mean for kids to not only be consumers in the virtual augmented and mixed reality spaces, but to become the actual producers themselves. So this right here, well, you should introduce yourself. Oh, hi. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this right here is my classroom. Uh, about seven years ago, I transferred tr over from teaching kids about English literature and language arts to teaching kids about computer science and video game development, and I knew almost nothing coming in. And what that did was it opened up this opportunity for me to become a learner in this space as well. So kids would be like, hey, I want to learn about VR, and I'd be like, sweet, let's do that. I have no idea what we're doing. Let's learn together. And what came out of it is uh, 
our classroom is now a fully equipped game studio. So it's called Cybertech Studios, and we do everything from live action motion capture to audio recording to uh, immersive technologies like what you see on the screen. So we work with the uh, Microsoft HoloLens, the HTC Vive, we work with the Oculus Rift, we've done some stuff with the Magic Leap, we got into the Meta 2 before they went and tanked, and we're hoping to get into the HoloLens 2 trial, uh, and we're in conversations about that. Over the course of the years, my kids have gotten into doing uh, 3D modeling and design and doing stuff with like 3D printers and stuff, all the way up to doing augmented reality applications where we have holographic periodic tables and things like that. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other projects, but what that's done is it's allowed the opportunity for kids like Stuart to have a place to start. So two years ago, I was actually part of his uh, classroom uh, game studio. And I actually developed a senior project uh, called the Smithsonian Presidential Gallery in VR. Uh, I developed it for the Oculus Rift using Unity and pretty much everything except for the actual Smithsonian scans uh, made by the DPO. I modeled and, lit and did everything myself. And it was pretty cool. I tweeted about it and then the Smithsonian retweeted me and I got this really cool internship uh, that I did this last summer <laughs> where I basically Started from scratch and did a whole thing over. I made a m virtual museum about uh, the Apollo 11 mission uh, in honor of the 50th anniversary. I missed the deadline by like a month, but that's okay. <laughs> so uh, the idea of behind all this is I, a student uh, in Colorado at the time, couldn't fly uh, 2,000 miles uh, to see a Smithsonian museum in person. So uh, for me and others like myself, I developed a museum in which I could. And that was the idea behind these. It's making virtual museums that are able to be put in the hands of people who can't go to the museums themselves. Uh, outside of that, uh, so virtual reality is about doing the impossible, such as going to, uh, to Washington DC and seeing all these really cool things. But then that's boring and who wants to spend all day in a museum. So, uh, last year, <laughs> last year I uh, spent some time with my local planetarium developing a virtual experience where it actually sends you to the moon. So, I'm going to show you a little video of that because the video didn't work on the PowerPoint. We're okay. Yeah, so what you can do is you can play golf on the moon and experience one six gravity physics. Do you like the freesound.org music I got on? It's pretty cool. So we have uh, this lovely uh, virtual experience where you can mess around with uh, these uh, moon physics, but it's like in the middle of a uh, museum and it gets all the young people and all the older people and all the, uh, all the people and they all love it. It's awesome. So you can play around, it's super cool. So with, uh, with that whole idea, what it's really all about is putting these fantastical experiences in the hands of those people that can't necessarily do that. And using digitized assets and uh, museum resources in this direction it's pretty, pretty awesome. So we've kind of transitioned, like I said, from just doing video games into doing more immersive things. And so these are some of the kids that are currently working on different kinds of projects. Um, this up here, up at the top left, you can't really see it, but there's a little tablet that is over on the, on the back um, part of the table. And one of my students made a video about how he was working on a national portrait gallery experience um, as a part of as a part of a um, like art gallery that we're making to feature our own students. So part of our virtual reality art gallery is actually going to be a room that has assets from the National Portrait Gallery. And anytime that you look away from a picture, it'll be replaced with another picture. So you can spend an infinite amount of time exploring the collections without ever actually leaving the space. Um, this right here, I, I can't play the video, but this right here is like really early prototype where we have different kinds of uh, pictures all over different kinds of places and we have a dedicated room so that we can put those assets into it. This right here is a project that we're actually doing in partnership with people from the Hydros. Uh, we have their 3D models and one of the things that was up on, um, on one of the slides 
that you presented was the handbook that goes along with some of the educational materials. We have access to those materials and we are now taking the 3D models that are being scanned by the Hydros and by the Smithsonian and making those augmented uh, reality applications. And then this right here is um, Jimmy Neutron. He is, he is uh, looking at us through the Magic Leap and one of the projects that we're doing with that one is we're turning our cafeteria into a mixed reality air and space museum using assets from NASA and from the digitized assets from the DPO. And then this over here is a project that we're getting into with the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs where we are having history students from UCCS identify primary and secondary sources that describe specific moments in history, and then we are turning those into virtual reality experiences that you can actually walk around in, play in, and actually experience as if you were being there, kind of. Um, so those are some of the ones that we have on tap, but we also, can you hit the next slide? But we also uh, have been doing some other kinds of things. So we got into doing some work with the uh, Marianas Young Professionals and with East Carolina University. East Carolina University has a maritime studies department and they've been going out to Saipan and they've been doing underwater scans of wreckage sites from World War II and they gave us access to all of their materials and we built a virtual museum for the Pacific Maritime Heritage Trail Battle of Saipan. And the really cool thing about that was that not only did we do that with the kids that were here in Colorado, or there in Colorado. But we also actually went out to Saipan and we worked with kids on the island in order to have them do some of the work too. And then the second year that we went to do this, we actually brought students from Colorado. So up in the middle there, uh, that's one of my students, her name is Alani. And Alani was teaching the kids on the island how to take photogrammetry scans from this particular site and not only reconstruct that, but then do the 3D modeling and design work to try and recreate that site. But she was trying to teach the indigenous kids on the island how to do that themselves, because that matters. So we started this program called Open Reef Innovations and we're trying to continue this work as well. So these are some, just some pictures of me in DC this summer. Uh, <laughs> so what does it all mean? That's the question here. Uh, and what it really comes down to is technology is gaining speed faster and faster. It's developing more and more. And a lot of us can't really uh, keep up with it. Uh, Lord knows I can't. So what that really means for museums and educational institutions uh, like the one I go to or the one he works at or the one she works at. Uh, what that really means uh, for these institutions is we've got to get with the times and really push uh, towards virtual reality because it can make education so much more potent. I can't go to the moon but in virtual reality, I can, and I get to play with uh, golf, uh, golf and baseball bats and stuff like that and see how that would interact with 1-6 gravity. And that's really cool, and that wasn't possible 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, really, so pretty cool stuff. And I wanted to give you a why. You're here talking about digitization and why does it matter? It matters because of them. Because all of these kids, all the ones that I get to work with, but also all the ones that are just like them everywhere in the world, they want to have access. They want to be able to see these museums. They want to be able to have these experiences. But even more than that, they want to be able to create them. They want to build the future that they want to inherit. And you have the power to give them the access to do that. Now, that comes with some responsibilities, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit in the Q&A section, but, but it's really important that as you think about how you're going to digitize your assets, that you're thinking about how you do democratize access to it, and how you provide some guidelines and some rails that people can kind of follow as they start to step into these spaces where they are now creating their own realities. Just giving them access probably isn't enough, but it's a really good start. So keep doing that work. Follow me on Twitter.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just, one of the roles of our office is we built a platform that gives, it was designed primarily for teachers and now we're looking at what the interface should be for students, but it was to give schools, teachers access to all the digital resources of the Smithsonian and where they could also upload other resources from other cultural institutions or trusted sources and along with tools for creating. So what the shift is, is our office used to make a lot of things for teachers that we then sent as publications to schools and later as digital versions. Now it's really what uh, Sean and Stuart are talking about. It's giving people the resources to build themselves. So the other thing we're doing is studying, once we give them the resources, what do people do with it? And what is the impact on students? And in part of that, we learn what the challenges are that teachers face. So what I want to show you is just one short four minute video of a teacher. And this is Gary Glaske. He's a fourth grade teacher. And he teaches in Pittsburgh. And uh, Gary has no computers in his classroom. He does not have tablets, and yet he still finds a way to use our content. And in this video, he's asking his students the question, a relevant question to the purposes of this conference, is what is technology? You're going to have a little trouble hearing the student voices, but Gary always repeats what they said, so you'll be able to follow the discussion. As you look at this video, or as I look at this video, I think about two things. The first is, how do I know they're engaged? We talk about it being engagement. What's my proof of that? And the second is, is something else happening here beyond engagement? We know that you have to have engagement in order to learn. If I'm not paying attention, how will I learn? But is engagement sufficient for learning? What else do we have to provide? And should we be setting the bar a bit higher in terms of education? With that, I'm going to show the video, and then we'll go to our discussion. I just went back. Oh, I see. Okay. It's pretty bad when the director of technology can't work PowerPoint. But... There we go. Sorry. <laughs> common misconception among elementary age students is that technology only refers to those things that are powered by electricity, um, but this experience leads them to a deeper understanding of technology and engineering. The insights gained also allow them to see that engineering and science is a creative endeavor and that um, innovation and technology have had a huge impact on the world in which we live. I saw a lot of great thinking going on. Um, I saw a lot of connections, a lot of arrows pointing to other people's thoughts. I saw somebody write, I never thought of that. So let's just kind of summarize um, what we uh, may have learned. So what is technology? Rowan. That there always has to be a source of power. Charlie? Uh, you need to like, you, the power source can't always be on, so sometimes you're going to need to have Charge power source. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Anna? Both examples are about a power source. We start the lesson with a chalk talk where students explore the question, what is technology? And then students work collaboratively using the See, Think, Wonder routine. Uh, and they look closely at examples, everyday objects as examples of technology. For example, a paper clip, a sticky note, and um, scissors. And then students uh, examine the parts and they make note of uh, what problem the object solves. Uh, and they think about also what might some other potential uses for the object might be. And they start to discover that technology is everywhere around us and that engineers are people that create technologies. So the question is, is it human made or natural? What it do you think? Be both. What, why, no, what makes you say that? You would but the, the spoon itself, do we find those like out in the natural world growing on trees? No. So it's human made. What else could we use it for? Yeah. So what problem uh, do you think the paper clip solves?
Okay, so it organizes paper. What do you think people may have used before the paper clip was designed? Any ideas? Really? A paper weight, maybe, yeah, okay. All right, uh, so is the paper clip human made or is it natural? Human made. Okay, uh, so we don't find paper clips like growing on trees, right? No, all right. What did all of these, um, these mystery objects have in common then? Rachel? So they're all made by humans, and what else? Let's look at our, our chart. What else do they have in common? Rowan? So different uses, right? They all solve a problem, meet a need. Okay. Next, uh, students complete a sort using resources from the Smithsonian Learning Lab collection, and they decide whether or not those are examples of technology. Uh, and as a result, they're able to come to the conclusion uh, that technology is the human use of scientific knowledge to solve a problem or meet a need, and that it also includes processes like farming uh, or even systems like the Morse code. A hand axe? Yeah, because they carve it. Yeah, they carve it. Yeah. Butterflies are man-made. They're not man-made. How about smartphone? Yay. Yep. The wooden toy. Wooden toy is technology. How about the bike? Yes. How about a bonnet? Yes. Bonnet's technology? No. Yes. Bonnet is technology. Shoes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how about the game controller? Yes. You all agree on that. Telegraph key? Yes. You guys made a model of a telegraph? How about Morse code? Yes. Yes. Farming? No. Yes. Farming, yes. Yeah, so for me, as I really began to examine what understanding is and the, the processes involved, I recognized that in times in my classroom, uh, we were more focused on maybe completion of work and delivery of content rather than developing a deep understanding. So now when I plan lessons, um, units, I ask, you know, what does thinking and learning look like? Um, what learning will be most relevant? To these kids uh, in, in the world that they live and um, how do I know if my students are learning. I'll stop there and then we'll meet for a discussion. I want to thank you for your pre Can you hear me? No. You hear me now? Yeah? Okay. I want to thank you for your presentations. And now we have a few minutes to talk. I have a couple of questions, and then I'd like to open it up to the floor. Uh, one of the questions I struggle with is trying to figure out, you elaborated a bit on it, Stuart, about what is the value of a digital experience versus an in-person. This last summer I was with a 10-year-old niece hiking in a national park and she likes art so I brought along all these art supplies and in her aunt's mind we stopped and I thought she would draw nature and she pulled out her phone and <laughs> she pulled up an image from her phone and started drawing that. And when I asked Frankie, I said, Frankie, we're in the national park, isn't there something you want to draw here? She said, no, I'm good. <laughs> so. <laughs> This is a personal experience for me, but help me to think about how do we decide what's the value of the digital piece and what's the value of the in-person? So I think uh, it's a great question and I, for museums and especially collections, it's kind of a more obvious answer where you know you, you can't necessarily put your hands on a museum specimen uh, usually you can't as a as a visitor maybe you can look at it but a, a 3d model that is you know you're not 
if it's still digital, you're not putting your hands on it, right? But you can still manipulate it. You can click on, hopefully, eventually click on certain parts of it to have pop-up annotations that tell you about it. And, and then again, we can print 3D print as well and then create a more hands-on model of something that you can't touch in nature. I think that it's really interesting to, to just whet people's appetite a little bit because they're not gonna come to your museums if they don't know why they should come to your museums. But you might be able to convince a kid in Saipan that they actually do wanna come to Washington DC because they could throw rocks on the moon and they might actually get to see the rock that was actually on the moon. And if they don't know that that's possible, then they may not come to your museum at all. It also can help you out, I think, um, you know, when LaToya was up here earlier and she was asking the question, like, where are we in this? Sometimes museums need to be able to show people how they've evolved over time. Because sometimes people will have a conception in their mind of what your museum is based off of what they heard 50 years ago. It may be more inclusive now, but they may not know that. So if you can create digital experiences that help them see themselves in your museum, you may be able to increase their likelihood of wanting to come. Uh, in terms of like digital versus in real life uh, experiences, the if you can get the real life experience, always go with that. But the point of the digital space uh, in this context is really about accessibility. And if you can't have that real experience, digital comes in to try and make it as real as possible with uh, virtual mix and augmented reality. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, I keep forgetting to also mention that we now have underwater VR experiences. So a lot of people who would, are you know, never going to have that real life experience of scuba diving can do it digitally. And, and the, I was interested in the conversation earlier about distribution because that's still the main problem that the Hydras faces as well with their VR experience. Um, another question I have is, we talk about engagement, and often museums have been focused on engagement, the idea that you come to a museum and you experience something and it could ignite a lifelong interest because you may only be able to visit the Smithsonian once in your lifetime. But now that it's digital, if engagement is focused in simulating an interest, I wonder if we're limiting ourselves and if with that bar and if it can't be much more than that. And if so, what would you envision in the future? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I tend to live my life like five years out and I can't wait for us to have mixed reality headsets that let people bring your museum collection into their house and actually curate their house with the kinds of experiences that you have in the Smithsonian. And that's not that far away. I mean, my kids are already working on something like that for our cafeteria and while distribution is a huge problem and we have no idea how we would be able to distribute it eventually, you potentially have the opportunity for people to take these digital assets and actually feel like they own them in some ways, which makes it more likely that they're gonna care about, about the history. And when we think about trying to prep for the long term and trying to get people to think about why preservation matters, you have to give them a sense of ownership of some of this stuff. And that's what we're on the verge of with virtual reality and augmented and mixed reality and being able to take these experiences that you have in your museums and actually make them something that other people can own in their spaces. Now there's dangers with that, right? Like this is why it's so important to still be doing curation. We need curators to help tell the stories so that people learn how to tell the stories. I think that it's also vitally important that people like you start thinking about how kids can actually do some of this work because you heard it earlier today, doing this kind of work in virtual and mixed and augmented reality spaces requires a different way of thinking about storytelling and if we wait until the kids get to the point where they can be devs, we're going to lose out on a lot of potential developer insight because my kids are all kinds of creative. 
they're probably way more creative than most of the adults that I know. So if we can get them to be the people that are thinking about how we tell stories with these objects, you're probably going to get way cooler experiences and they're going to feel like they own it way earlier in their life, which will make them care about the conversation about preservation. Yeah, I love that you've taken it to the next level and not just using digital assets to teach people, but to teach people how to use them to teach people, right? So uh, that's amazing. Uh, but it's, we still have that intermediate level where we're still, we want to use the resources just to teach people facts about whatever we've digitized. And I think the storytelling is so important and we need both you know, experts in the, the content and then also people who know how to tell, create a story using that information. And so I think, you know, getting, <laughs> collaborating with the entertainment crew from earlier would help a lot. I liked that question about the potential, uh, what was the word they used? It, they were talking about whether or not education and entertainment are in conflict in some way, but no, I think that they should be close partners. Uh, just a little comment on that with it being, uh, a form of storytelling. With this being such a new medium, uh, all these uh, digital experiences and digital education, we're not really doing it right because it uh, it just always could be a lot better. You can even watch like any anything on National Geographic or the History Channel, and it's still not the most effective. Uh, film has been around for a hundred years as an in, uh, as an entertainment industry, and there are still being uh, new avenues explored every day. So what's important is uh, to be able to get virtual reality uh, moving and constantly updating and comp uh, becoming a better version of itself uh, every, every iteration. Uh, so it's important to explore the avenues with education inside of that. Um. Sean, you mentioned it in my beginning definition of engagement. I talked about it in one way. It's about a commitment, a kind of responsibility that I'm going to show up on the day of the wedding or I'll meet you for lunch. And you talked about it's one thing to put the resources out there, but it's another to think about laying out lines of responsibility. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So. We made this World War II museum with these scans from East Carolina University. And some of my students are freshmen and they're so far removed from World War II that they may not actually understand the importance of some of the things that they're looking at yet. But they still have access to wreckage sites from World War II where people actually died. And so they, the first group of kids that I had that worked on this project, they built this museum and then a bunch of them graduated, so they passed this experience off to the next group of devs that I had that wanted to take on the project. And those kids started talking about ways that they could bring interactivity into this space. And they started thinking about, well, we could have a scavenger hunt. And it was like, cool, that might be an interesting way to do it. I was really happy that they weren't like, we could have a first person shooter, right? At the same time, when they started talking about having a scavenger hunt, they were like, oh, and we could have people go out and try to find unexploded ordnance. And I was like, or not, because, <laughs> because we probably, even if we can get a model of a grenade that hasn't exploded, that may not actually be what we want to have people experience as they put on this headset, right? So, so it's one thing to make this stuff available. It's another thing to make it available and help people understand the cultural context around it and how to actually use these, these resources. Because if you, as the curators and experts and the people that are doing the digitization and the people that understand the history, if you don't provide that information in an easily digestible way, you have the potential that people are going to take that beautiful ivory tusk that we saw yesterday. For those of you that were in the thing yesterday, they had this beautiful ivory tusk that was carved and, and it had all, the, all these um, characters that were on it. If you just make that available to people, you're gonna have a population that may go off and actually turn that into the handle for a sword. And like, is that really what you want? You know, we have to do, I think, a really good job of prioritizing how we're going to teach educators how to use these resources. But you also have to think about how you're going to empower creators to use these resources so that they're not engaging in cultural appropriation and that they're not using um, 
these, these objects that you're digitizing or these photographs or whatever in ways that would actually be really offensive or, or culturally negative. And what usually happens is that education gets put pretty far down on the totem pole because you don't make a lot of money with us. But there's a, there's a true need as we think about this whole digitization movement to really think about how you're gonna prioritize educational aspects of it so that you don't have people who discount the value of the digitization because of the usage that people put it, put it in with. With that, I want to open it up for your questions. I have a lot more, but I'm sure you have questions as well. Oh, sorry, Sam. Thank you guys so much. This is a great discussion and a great topic. It's really exciting. Um, but going back to a comment about distribution and ownership of the SI collections that you're using to teach your students. So they already own parts of these objects. You know, the objects that we care for on a daily basis belong to the people of this nation and really to the world. So we maybe need to do a better job internally and in working with you all externally to try to convince them that they already own it. So having it as part of their you know, house, they can do it virtually and things like that, it's just a celebration of the ownership that they already have. So maybe that's something that we could talk about more internally, or if you have ideas about how we could partner more with the education world to make that ownership known, um, that would be great to hear about. I got you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, that's a really good point, but I feel like there's also this very f fine line between like, just talking about ownership of the collections in general because so many of them were collected from a time like colonialist era of exploration around the world where we have all of these specimens with biological and you know collections from other areas that technically the Smithsonian owns but it, like do we really want to be we just have to be careful about that because like maybe we shouldn't own them as a country right <laughs> I don't know Also, just uh, another little comment on that. Um, privatization of education is stupid. Um, I'm so brave for saying that. No. Uh, <laughs> like uh, that, that moon experience I showed you, I don't own that because I was paid min uh, minimum wage for doing that. I don't own that. Uh, and I don't think anyone should be able to uh, necessarily own educational stuff and it should just be uh, put into creative common spaces, but that's not gonna happen because capitalism. Uh, uh, so like what's, um, uh, what is important uh, for people in education to do and people outside of education is to uh, push towards uh, the, uh, the, the decentralization and the, uh, the making education public and accessible to everyone. Uh, that wants to get educated, and yeah. Any other questions? I'm gonna go here first. Um, yeah. Oh come on! I know. Or you can run. Okay. Yes, true. Okay. Can you hear me now? Um, so working in education inside of the museums is one thing. Looking at uh, education from outside of the museums into us. How do you imagine students can use uh, digitization, um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed realities to contribute to, enhance, or otherwise really just improve and expand upon the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian rather than just manipulating, curating, or using what we've already produced? How can they make it better? So we don't have permission to do most of the things that we do in my classroom anyway. Um, so what we've kind of done is we've just sort of taken 
flyers and handouts and things that uh, you all have produced and that others, others have produced. And we started thinking about what is the content that we could potentially overlay on top of that or that we could use to add depth to it or could we repurpose that inside of experiences that we've created and try to make them interactive that way. Um, super blurry lines right now in terms of, you know, like, yes, we own the artifacts kind of, but do we really own it if we want to distribute it. Like, even if we could figure out a distribution method and it was easy for us to do, do we actually have permission to, to use some of the pieces that we can find on your sites? And um, so there are those kinds of questions that are out there. It's a whole lot easier for us to take your stuff and to just slap whatever we want on top of it because we created it and we can do whatever we want. That doesn't necessarily add value though. And so I think that what we need to do is probably have better conversations or a better method of communication in order for people to really have that conversation about how do we add value to the things that are already being done in your museums and how can students move from being developers that are external and separated even if they kind of have permission into being the actual developers that help to create the experiences with the blessing of the institution. So I've got, like I said, multiple kids right now that are gonna be using your assets in order to create experiences. Is the Smithsonian gonna partner with us or with them to try and get those distributed or are we just doing it on our own for our own sake? And those are the kinds of conversations that we probably have to have, but because of all of the legal issues and privatization and the concerns about that, you know, like we probably have to have a formal contract, an agreement, and who has the time to develop that pipeline? But I would totally encourage you that as a whole institution, you probably want to start thinking about that because the kids are going to start developing whether you give them your blessing or not. So it'd be a whole lot easier for everybody involved to probably develop the processes that would empower kids to become devs for you in the ways that you would want them to from the beginning, as opposed to trying to do it retroactively after you already have lots and lots of people that are working on things themselves. But I don't know what that process is. Um, on a, another note, so as a, as a biology teacher, a lot of the time that I spend talking about science is actually also talking about careers in science because a lot of the, you know people in my classes are, are pursuing careers in science and I think it would be cool if museums and okay I, I'm not like fully aware of everything that you're already doing but uh, highlighted and maybe like had digital access to the scientists themselves or had some sort of you know what if people if when they're going out on an expedition had were actually gathering more about kind of digital kind of data about the experience themselves, maybe creating more, um, I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head, but careers in science, let's, let's tell people about that. <laughs> and the Smithsonian is, in the same way that you're connected to lots and lots of researchers, you're connected to lots and lots of other people too, helping to develop or establish relationships between people that are developing content and the educators or the kids or the other way around, like helping the kids and educators go through you to get access to the kind of people that were up here on stage that are making these experiences professionally, that, that could also probably bear some pretty nifty fruit. Do we have time for another question? Yes, yes. Okay, okay so Sean, the... Uh, Lessons that you're putting together, they're very kind of multidimensional and they encompass a whole lot of different subjects. Uh, so I was seeing not only just the VR development, um, but programming and probably some project management in there just as part of your primary lesson plans. And then you've also got uh, American history uh, and some public history and museum studies uh, in creating that virtual American history uh, exhibit. So how much coordination do you have with other teachers in your school and their curriculums? And um, Stuart, how much of that did you feel like you were learning? Or was it kind of snuck in there? I can go first. Really? Okay. Google. Google helps a lot. Like, this, this isn't an insult on you, but like, the, the, learning, the learning I did was very self-driven, uh, and uh, so when it came to learning how to 3D model, uh, I googled how do I 3D model, and when it came to 
how do I uh, program? He helped, of course, but again, Google. Uh, what's important is just uh, no one person is going to learn all of this, and uh, no one uh, no one person should be expected to learn everything. So what's important is to kind of just like uh, let people figure it out with uh, as much resources as you can possibly get them. There you go. Yeah. So what he said, I. My teaching philosophy is if I can get a kid invested in trying to solve a really significant problem, then chances are they'll go off and they'll figure out the how. They'll figure out the step by step as long as I can give them some of the guidance and direction. The, the th there are a lot of people that approach computer science education right now from the perspective of we need to teach kids how to code. And I approach it from a very different perspective, which is we need to teach kids why to code. Because if we can teach them why they're coding, they'll figure out the how and they'll actually have the, the reason, the purpose to stay with it when it gets super hard. Because they're already invested in the project, they're already invested in the problem, they're already trying to make a solution. So I don't spend as much time as I probably should doing all of those things that you said. I spend most of my time teaching kids about project management and having conversations with them when they get stuck. And then I usually tell them there's you know, 30 people that are in this room. One of them might have the, the answer. Don't assume that I'm gonna have the answer and I don't have a degree in museum curation and in history and in, like I've taken a lot of college classes on a lot of different things. I've forgotten most of what I've learned. Um, but it doesn't matter because if you can empower a kid to solve the problem that they wanna solve and you can give them the tools to solve it and you can step in at targeted places to try and help them out when they, when they truly do get stuck and they don't know how to, how to solve something, that's how you get them to the point where they can actually make the really cool things. A lot of the time, I don't actually know the answer. Like when my kids come to me and they ask about coral reef stuff because we're doing stuff with the hydros, I'm gonna be like, sorry bro, I don't know. But I know someone that does. <laughs> And I can help them get connected with her. And that's what matters. The issue that I think that we've got in education right now is that we have a lot of people who want to control the entire process. And there aren't enough supports for those of us that are doing the work. So I have 150 unskilled laborers that are trying to run, co-run with me, a video game design studio. And like, yeah, none of us know how to do all of the pieces, but together we're a lot smarter than we are individually. I have a very specific follow-up question. Wait, so you could, oh, sorry, I just yeah, want one quick, uh, could, when you, go, did you try to Google how to make a museum exhibit? Oh, no, it's like, uh, I'm just, research history for that project uh, was probably like 2,000 searches Okay, I was just wondering what came up, if you did. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. So my question is actually about that, sort of sharing that information and having to learn that on your own. So. Um, I'm curious if you feel that educators can and should share the ways that these collections are being adapted within your classrooms, both among each other, but also back with the institutions so that we can get better guidance on doing exactly what you're asking and creating a sort of path for how to utilize options of how to utilize the collections. My God, yes. Please, please help us find, like, help me find the other educators that are doing this work. And then help me get connected to Google so that Google can help us put together the, the, the networking system that we would need to connect those educators and connect them back to the Smithsonian. Or get me connected to Facebook or get me connected to anybody who's doing the work. Because we need to do a way better job. The issues that we run into in terms of high school level development for these sorts of technologies and experiences, way different than what you would have if you were at a college. And it's way different than what you would have if you were in a professional workplace. Because we have issues around time that you don't have in some of those other spaces quite as much. We have issues around the, the level of skill that our students have. We have issues with firewalls and privacy that you don't have at some of the other levels. So we need to have better conversations with the people that are doing this work. The issue right now is that 
there isn't a really good place to go, and this is related to the distribution problem, there isn't a really good place to go to get connected to all of the people that are doing this work because they're doing it for the Oculus or they're doing it for the Vive or they're doing it for the whatever and there isn't a centralized location for people that are doing curated museum experiences that exist on multiple platforms that are being produced by high school kids or middle school kids or elementary school kids. Like that doesn't exist, but it should. And we, like, we could be the ones that make that a thing. So like, help me build that. Yeah, and I mean, it, I'm overwhelmed just thinking about all the time you must already be spending on like doing everything you do. And like, I'm overwhelmed having just started a new job teaching and it takes so much time just to put together like what you're gonna do each day that putting in that, those extra hours of networking with other educators and then also like going back to where your resources are coming from and it's like there are, should be people whose entire job is coordinating education not you know not putting it on the, the teachers themselves so you know if we have this huge problem of like every teacher reinventing how to teach a, a lesson uh you know every week like why don't we get jeff bezos to fund that problem <laughs> it's just my idea score I want to thank the panel. I learned a great deal and I enjoyed it so much. So please join me in thanking the panel. And I, want to, I want to thank the digitization program because you're always supportive of education thank and you. its role in including us in the conference. Of course. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we have a 10 minute break now. If you could be back at, let's see, uh, 2.40. Thank you. <laughs>